My name's Mark Hughes. I am the host today, and our presenter is Greg Zeraldo. If you haven't heard Greg before, let me tell you, you're in for a treat. And you might be asking yourself, wait, 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 wait. Is it really the Greg Zeraldo? That's right, the Greg Zeraldo. You've heard about him. You might even have the Greg uh, Zeraldo bobblehead or the Greg Zeraldo action figure with live karate chop action and his signature catchphrase at the end of the day. Some of you in the lunchroom might have even eaten the Greg Zeraldo sandwich. Yes, Greg, that's where your sandwiches have been going. Great. With that, so <laughs> with that, Greg, tell us a little bit about your background and experience. Well, it's hard to top that to you, Mark. Uh, thanks for being <laughs> uh, co-hosted with the uh, the Rabbit's Dude Alive. So I appreciate that. Um, I uh, I've spent the better part of twenty years in uh, high reliability um, PCB manufacturing and PCB day. Um, started with. Uh, TTM Technologies years ago, um, worked through a lot of different programs um, with uh, Lockheed Martin and Woody Beyond. Um, and then I've been with the Advanced Assembly for the last four years. Join the ride. Yeah, and Advanced Assembly has always focused on quick turn PCBs, right? We wanna make things as fast as you can, as fast as you need them. But it really, really started going at crazy speeds when Greg came on board. And we are just so happy to have you, man. So with that, um, this webinar, the reason that we were, I was asked to organize this is we've got a lot of questions about vias. And we do have some content already on our blogs, but there's been enough questions going through the sales that we figured it was a good chance to review it. So we're gonna go and talk about via fabrication, how they're made, uh, what vias you can make economically and which ones you can't. And then we're gonna talk about some assembly issues associated with vias. And then after that, we'll take questions. Again, as we go through, please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A. Uh, more than happy to field them if we can, right then and there on that slide. And if not, we'll try to pick up as many as we can at the end. Yeah. All right, with that, um, Greg, you ready? Greg? Okay. Yep, I'm still here. Sorry about oh, that. Oh, you're still, okay. We got a, uh, an audio request from you if uh, there's anything you can do to tweak your audio, but I don't know if there's anything we can do live. So we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do. All right, as a board, as a designer makes a board and you know, they, they do everything, they submit their designs to the Fab House and the Fab House does a DFM and a DFA. And I was wondering if you might be able to tell us a little bit about what those services are and uh, what they're looking for with relation to vias. So when we're looking at something, when we're, as far as for design to manufacture, I mean, at the end of the day, just like the slide says, is can the board be built? Can the board be built to the way that the drawing is laid out? Um, you know, in specific with, you know, this webinar is, you know, the focus on vias, but, you know, one of the biggest contentions of manufacturability is what type of vias are being designed into the fab and how did that, how does that via uh, design translate into the DFA, the design for assembly? Because it's one thing to go ahead and laminate a board, to drill it, to plate it, and all those pieces, but then you turn around and start placing parts on it and you're up against a whole other issue of solder thieving and other design um, uh, related issues on the assembly side. So um, it's a great start. And we can go from there as we go through the slides. All right. Well, thanks, Greg. Uh, one of the issues that, that I often see engineers ask, you know, if something passes DFM or DFA, that still doesn't make it economical to make. Is that correct? percent absolutely why is that well what you're looking for is when you look at the design of the board you're looking to see is is how it can be made and is it you know is it cost effective to do it you know what we see is a lot of design engineers will try to cram you know 100 pounds into a five pound bag scenario where there's incorporating technology, um, whether it's blind vias, buried vias, micro vias into a design that doesn't necessarily need it. Um, and then 
that exponentially increases the cost. And so you can really trim back a lot of that and make it more affordable to build, make it more manufacturable to, to build by understanding the concept of VIAs and really how they work. All right. Well, let's see if we can't understand it. Uh, we did have a question that I wanted to address. Somebody said, you know, what is a what does VIA stand for? It stands for vertical interconnect access. When you need to connect one spot on a board with another spot on the board, that is an interconnect. And oftentimes we think of traces, but as traces transition layers, and we'll show some graphics on this in just a second, um, they need to do so vertically rather than horizontally. And that's what VIA stands for, vertical interconnect access. All right, so I'm a designer. I have a, I have a project, you know, I export my Gerbers and I send them over to you. What happens with them at that point? It's going to go through the DFM process. So basically, there's design rules, standard design rules that the board house is going to be looking at. You know, you know minimum line width, minimum spacing, um, minimum hole size for mechanical drill. This incorporate laser gear, um, all of those different things. And so we're going to be looking at what the stack up is. Um, I like to use the turkey sandwich reference um, and we'll kind of get into a little bit of a deeper dive into this as we go through the slides. But essentially what you're looking at is that you have your two slices of bread, which is you can be your top and your bottom layers, your component side up and your component side lower. And then all of the, the meat and tomatoes and lettuce and everything like that is all of the inner layers and, uh, and interconnects that go along with them in your stack up. Um, your stack up is gonna obviously be calling out materials, it's going to be drawing out material thickness, the copper weights, um, et cetera. And this is also where you're going to be outlining any type of impedance calculations as well. Um, in the stack up, as the one shown here, um, there is a single drill. Um, so this is going to be just for your standard through hole drill. Um, and uh, um, from there, you can mix this into any different type of design. You can go into blind vias, berry vias, micro vias, et cetera. So if I have a, a design, at what point should, you know, as a new designer, at what point should I be talking stack ups with my board house? Immediately. That's the first, I mean, it's essentially that's a conception of the design and idea. Um, if your stack up isn't done right, um, everything, every value that you have uh, slotted out for what the performance of the board is supposed to be doing is contingent on that stack up. Um, if your stack up is not vetted out first, um, everything else that you do after that is kind of irrelevant, to be honest with you. All right. Thanks, Greg. Um, so maybe now's a good time, do you think, to talk about how boards are put together? Sure. Absolutely. All so, right. So, yeah. That, um, question, that yeah. was a yeah, open-ended question to you. I'm kidding. That was, <laughs> yeah. that was poorly set up. Okay, so there's lots of different ways that boards are put together. But the, the basic idea is that we take uh, conductors and insulators and we glue them together. Can you tell us, you know, the, the two basic ways that boards are, are, are put together? Sure, yeah. So what we have a visual representation of here is what we call what the, either a cap construction or a foil construction. The cap construction is going to be essentially a copper clad or copper sandwiched uh, layers that are laminated together, then incorporate pre-preg in between them, um, and then they get laminated together. Um, the foil construction um, is going to be uh, essentially the same thing, um, but you're going to have two layers of this actual copper foil as your layers of bread that are on the outside of your stack up. Um, really depending on your design and what you're trying to achieve with your build is really you pick one or the other. Um, at the design stage, if you are not sure which one to do, you can work with your board house and say, look, this is kind of what I'm looking for. And the board house is going to determine what type of construction are you going to use, whether it's cap or foil, depending on what type of vias are present, what type of technology you're building into the board. So, uh from a board fabrication standpoint, my understanding is that they would much rather do a foil or a sequential construction, uh, if at all possible. Have you heard that or do you know? It's again, it's gonna depend on the fees used in it, um, right? I mean, I think you probably elaborate, oops, you elaborate on that a little bit more. Okay. Well, let's elaborate a little bit more. Uh, and, and while we do that, we are hearing a little bit of muffled 
coming from you. It's even though you've got your headset plugged in, can you confirm that your headset is the audio source and it's not pulling in through your laptop speaker? Um, and then I'll tee up the next slide. So there's a few different types of vias and they have different costs associated with them. Uh, most of the time, you know, I, I don't want to say most of the time, all of the time, boards have through hole, at least some through hole vias on them. But sometimes, you know, especially when space is a, an issue, engineers will put in a blind or a buried via as well. The costs for blind and buried vias goes up because they require extra process steps. If we go back to our traveler, blind and buried vias make the traveler, that thing on the right hand side, longer. It takes more time, there's more risk associated with it, so your cost goes up. Um, what else? I, I just did the mechanically, or I just did the three vias on the left, Greg, but maybe you can tell us the difference between uh, those and micro vias and mechanically versus laser made vias. Um, yeah, before I go into that, can you hear me a little bit better? It's about the same, so I think that's just the audio we're going to have. Let's not worry about it and we'll just soldier through. Sounds good. Sorry about that, guys. No, that's okay. Uh, yeah, so you're looking at, on the right side, you're looking at uh, what we call stacked or staggered. Um, and this is really when you start kind of getting into the HDI or high density interconnect uh, world of PCB fabrication. Essentially, what you're looking at with this um, is multiple lamp cycles, usually, you know, um, four, three, four lamination cycles um, at a minimum, depending on what your actual stack it looks like. Um, this is uh, really when you're looking for either um, space savings due to extremely dense board um, and maintaining signal integrity. Um, so it's not being spaced out through actual circuitry and routing. Um, everything is handled actually just through the via itself. Um, this is where you also on the flip side of it, you know, incur an exponential cost uh, to the fabrication itself, whether it's mechanically drilled with a drill bit, um, which I believe you're going down to about a five mil bit. Um, and then obviously anything below that in the micro view world, getting into actual um, laser views from there. Okay. Uh, and then we do have, um, I, I want to say there's some, there's some other seldom type use, uh, seldom used vias too. Um, aren't there some riveted ones or is that just mostly a, a do it yourself at home type thing? Um, yeah, I'm, I don't have uh, too much experience with that. Okay, your audio just changed substantially. Did you change something? Um, yeah, we'll get into that later. Cool, thanks, Greg. All right, well, with mechanically formed vias, right, we actually have a drill that goes down through it. And the smallest one that you can get is about 5.9 mils. But something you have to be careful of is that you don't exceed a 10 to 1 aspect ratio. Now, can you make, uh, by the way, an aspect ratio is the ratio of the diameter to the length of the hole that you're drilling. And if you make it too, you know, too long and too narrow diameter, it doesn't become possible to effectively plate the via later on. Right. So the smallest mechanical via that we can make is a 5.9 mil, uh, mil hole. Now, something to keep in mind is that boards come in standard thicknesses of, I believe, is it at 0.8, uh, 1.6 and 2.4 millimeters? Do you know what that converts to in uh, mils? Off the top of your head? No, it, it, not off the top of my head, though. But I mean, your standard board thickness is around 30 mils to 60 mils. I mean, depending on, you know, what type of just standard off-the-shelf materials you're going to use. Okay. So you got to be, just keep that in mind. If you've got a thin board, um, you can't have holes that are, or if, I'm sorry, if you have a thick board, you can't have holes that are too small diameter. Otherwise, it becomes difficult to plate them. Right. Uh, what about lasers? You know, with laser, you know, it's a completely different process that you're bringing into the equation of the fab. Um, obviously, with a laser drill, you can get to ridiculously small um, uh, drill sizes. Ultimately, what this is, is that, you know, just because you can put the hole in it doesn't mean that you can plate it. Um, your, uh, your fab shop would also have to have a, a pulse plating operation within um, to be able to 
basically program out how the copper is going to be thrown into the hole and over the knee of the hole. Um, with, uh, you know, generally speaking, you're going to have a mill of copper in the hole wall and on the knee um, of the via itself. Um, and obviously that's going to change up or down depending on what class you're into and obviously customer requirements. But, you know, once you're in micro via world, um, it's essentially impossible um, to uh, use any type of DC plating or anything like that, um, which is, a, you know, more of an old school method, but tons of shops still use it. Um, but yeah, the pulse plating is going to be an absolute necessity uh, okay. when you're drilling that small. So if you need something smaller than 5.9, uh, you can do laser, uh, laser drills, but um, you still have an issue with a minimum aspect ratio of one to one. So if you have a via that's two mils uh, in diameter, it can only go two mils down. To, so you need really, really tightly packed layers for something like that to work for you. So just a, a quick overview of how vias are made. After you get copper laminated together, a drill will come through and it will drill out all of your holes. If it's, uh, if that's for mechanical, if you're doing a laser via, it will just go through and it will carve. Mechanical drills will go all the way through um, and cut out you know, two or more layers. Excuse me, the lasers, it only goes down to the next closest copper. But it leaves a mess. So you've got to go through and do something called de smear and de burr to clean up the hole. How do they do that, Greg? Uh, they can usually do it through a mechanical process, um, or it can go through um, most companies will go through like a plasma process. Um, or there's actually a chemical process that it can go through down a, uh, a specific production line. Um, and basically what that does is that all of that evacuate and all that material that you're seeing on the left representation of that, um, it doesn't allow, once you start going to the uh, electrolyst plate and copper plate stages, which is kind of like your paint and primer stages, it doesn't give it a clean surface to adhere to. So your plating is gonna be disrupted. And ultimately, if you don't have good drill and if you don't have good plating, you're gonna ultimately experience latent failures down the road with your board. Okay, so it's something that you need to be very careful of. And another reason that you, that you don't wanna have aspect ratios that are, that are too great, otherwise you won't be able to properly clean out that board. Yeah, the one thing that can be said for this too is that, you know, I mean, so much of the preparation and so much of, you know, the little steps after, you know, the big steps that everybody thinks about is far more critical than the actual step of drilling. It's again, it's, you know, it's one thing to put a hole in a board, but if, if you don't have a clean hole to go in a plate with it or anything like that, the rest of your board is compromised. Yeah. Another reason you want to make sure that you're, you're using a quality board house. Um, I know the, the board house we use Royal, you know, they track the drill life, how many holes it's gone through. And at some point they'll just chuck it because yep. you want to, once your drill starts getting dull, those holes start becoming increasingly difficult to clean. Absolutely. So, all right. So after that, it, your board, after the hole, it has holes in it, however they're made, it's going to go through a laminator, you know, just kind of like you would see in your middle school break room, uh, just with different material on it. And this material, when you expose it to light, will polymerize and get really hard and strong and, you know, and, and stick to your board. The next thing that you do is go through a wash and wash away the, peer, the material that wasn't exposed to light. This light is in the pattern of your layer artwork, right? This is a Gerber layer that, um, uh, that gets, is it a Gerber layer that gets generated from your artwork? Or yeah, it is. Yeah, it's either, yeah. Customers can supply it or um, the cam engineer can design it if it's not provided. Okay. But yeah, yeah, but you're absolutely right. It's, a, it's basically a, an artwork layer that is imported into uh, the imaging equipment. Um, and then it just, you know, kind of like the old school days of, you know, sh developing photos and shooting pictures and everything in high school and college and everything like that. It's, it, it's going to shoot the image of that file um, onto the panel, onto the, onto the the, the bare copper itself, and then it goes through a, a developed process to actually develop and reveal the exposed areas. So what you're left with then is some exposed copper. After the wash, you're left with some exposed copper and some protected copper. 
And the next thing that they'll do is go through and put in some catalyst. Can you tell us anything about that? Uh, the metallic catalyst is going to be essentially, like I said, kind of alluded to the uh, the paint and primer stages. And so the, um, what you're looking at is more of an electroless copper um, deposition line um, that is essentially going to prep the hole before it goes into plate. Um, that that electroless line um, is going to just give it a... a a proper surface essentially for when it goes through plating to give it a really clean surface to adhere to. All right. Then after that, this whole thing is going to go into an electroplating tank. Everything that is exposed becomes thicker copper, right? right. Um, so what you're left with then, um, you know, is a big sheet of copper and this, this, uh, laminates material on it. So you've got to strip that stuff away and you're left with that big thing, that big sheet of copper. Next, the whole thing goes and gets etched. We strip away a, a prescribed amount of copper from every layer of the board. So this stuff, these features do shrink a little, but mostly you're left with, at that point, your traces, your vias and all that other good stuff. Anything you want to add there? Nope, that's all pretty much right there. Um, you know, once everything gets etched away and everything like that, um, you're going to be going into, um, you know, your further processes as, you know, if there is a whole fill operations, um, uh, et cetera, things like that. Greg, these graphics are just stunning. Where did you get these, man? Um, that's all you, dude. Oh, gosh. You know something? <laughs> now that I think of it, it is all me. <laughs> All right, we probably should have covered this a little earlier and I apologize for that. We were a little distracted with the sound, but um, I wanted to do a quick review on the cap versus foil. Focus your attention on the cap construction, right? You've got two pieces of copper and then a red and blue dielectric material. Um, in between boards, either a polyamid or some fiberglass and epoxy. And if we get it from the manufacturer like this, it's pre-laminated, it's called a core. And if once we need to join two cores together or two cores to any other foil, we'll put in something called a pre-preg, pre-impregnated uh, fiberglass. So this is fiberglass, it's got B stage epoxy in it. And when we put it together in these huge presses, it squeezes it together, it activates the epoxy, and then everything gets stuck. So again, on the left side, we've got cap construction. You've got two cores separated by two layers of, of pre-preg. Over on the foil construction side, you've got one core, four layers of pre-preg, and two layers of copper foil. Those will all get squeezed together and become the board. Now, the reason that I wanted to review this again, now that you know how vias are made, and this is just kind of a, a quick overview of the steps again, it gives you an idea of what vias can be made and which ones cannot be made economically, right? If you've got a cap construction, there's really no way for you to drill a hole from layer two to layer three. It, it just doesn't work. Foil construction, super easy to drill a hole from layer two to layer three. It might add some steps, but it's feasible. Um, anything else you want to add there, Greg? Oh, I think, you know, and again, going back to the audio issue, sorry about that. Um, you know, you would ask kind of, you know, what you're going to be going with, you know, depending on what you're going to be using and everything. With your cap construction, if you have a standard, you know, a single drill cycle that you're using in there and it's going all the way through from, you know, layer one through layer 10 or layer one through layer four, your cap construction is going to be your easiest and your most cost, cost effective way to do it. The only way to incorporate any type of uh, multiple lamination and multiple drill cycle of fabrication process is to use a foil construction. Um, and within that foil construction, you can also really kind of fine tune what your inner layer stack up looks like too, by using, you know, whether it's different layers of copper, different layers of pre-preg, um, different core material, et cetera. Okay. And then that gives you an idea of how these vias are made now that you know a little bit of what they are. 
through hole is a drill that happens after all the layers are sandwiched together and pressed and glued together. You drill all the way through and then you plate the whole thing. A buried via needs to happen on those interior layers before the lamination happens. So now you've added a second drill cycle to your, to your build because you've got to drill it once when, when you just have that core material. And then you've got to drill again once you laminate and, uh, and then you've got to do the whole process again, right? You've got to electroplate, you've got to etch. It adds steps. When you add steps, you add expense and things cost more. Blind the biggest, via, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, 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 no. Go ahead. I think one of the things, you know, that is not necessarily visible to a design engineer or, you know, a customer in general when they're going with a, uh, a blind via, buried via, micro via design is that the board house essentially just, you know, as you, what you kind of just touched on, Mark, is that you, even if your final assembly of panels only it constitutes four panels through the production line, okay? Ultimately, what happens with blind vias, buried vias, uh, micro, et cetera, is that you are creating a sub-assembly for every for every um, drill cycle. So if you have a blind via that goes from one to six and then another blind via from seven to 12, um, there's two sub-assemblies that make up the one panel. So now you have, it starts to exponentially compound itself by how many panels are going through the floor, how many panels need to be drilled, how many panels need to go through lamination again, how many panels need to be plated again, um, so on and so forth. So it's, you know, a lot of people kind of, you know, don't look at the bigger picture of why there's an exponential cost with it is because that four panel job now becomes 12 panels or it becomes, you know, whatever it ends up being, you know, depending on the, you know, the sub assemblies and everything like that. But there is just a significant more amount of work that goes into it, more work that's on the floor, more work for the management to manage, um, more work that goes through micro sectioning, um, so on and so forth. Okay. So just to kind of recap, because I know we're throwing a lot of terminology and stuff at you. Mechanical vias, those are the three on the left. Those are made with drills. Um, you know, we, we actually drill through and depending on the order that we laminate your, your board together, a buried via starts out as a through hole. It becomes buried when we put more layers on top of it. A blind via um, starts out as a through hole. It becomes blind when we laminate more, more layers on the bottom of it. Microvias are made with lasers, right? We just drill down to the next layer. We put foil on, we laminate it. Then we drill, you know, we, we, we keep up that process. Laminate foil, drill, plate. Laminate foil, drill, plate. And you can just start uh, building things up layer by layer by layer. So you can get some interesting connections between layers but you've also increased the cost because you're using lasers now to drill things and lasers are unfortunately quite slow. Um, you know, they're only like, I don't know if they're like five watts or something in there. They're, they're not powerful lasers. They can't be because you don't want to blow through the board. You just want to get down to the next, next layer. Um, so the microvias can give you some interesting things. They can let you, and you can do them from both sides. Right, you could leave out something between layer two and three. Um, I'm sorry, between say layers three and four, but you connect layers one and two and five and six. So you can do a blind on either side and skip a layer. That's totally do. That's totally doable. Um, we've got a couple questions here, and I think we answered the microvia how that should be different. Um, but then we've also got a question. It says on through hole vias, are all the layers connected to via or can you choose to eliminate a mid layer? For a through hole, Paul, um, that barrel's gonna go all the way through. There's really no way to break it. But if you did have something where you wanted to eliminate, you, you don't have to have um, via pads there, right? You, you don't have to have an electrical connection, but that copper is gonna go vertically through all the layers. If you needed something where you, you skipped some mid layers, you would probably want to do um, some blind vias or some micro vias. Anything you want to add there? 
No, right. I think that's, no, I think that's absolutely right. I think the best way to mitigate, <clears throat> if there's something where you, where you are doing a, a through hole uh, drill cycle on it, um, the only way that you would not be able to do the electrical connection is just to leave off the pad that's going to get connected to on the interconnect. Yeah. And just um, so yeah, you guys, go yeah, ahead. Otherwise it's, yeah, no, you, you, otherwise it's going to have to go to, uh, to, uh, you know, a different stack up line, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and something else to keep in mind too, is that those internal pads are going to be removed by the board houses anyway. They don't really add anything structurally to the design. So they get deleted by computer software, unless you specifically tell them to leave them. Okay, we've got a question on stacked versus staggered vias. Does it depend on the type of design? Uh, the answer is yes, it depends on the level of, um, not the level, but the, the number of layers. After you exceed a, a certain number, um, IPC recommends that you do staggered for increased reliability. Now, that being said, you are walking around with a device in your pocket right now that probably has 12 layers of stacked vias in it that are not, you know, not staggered, just straight stacked, um, and, and it's working just fine. Anything you want to add on that, stacked versus staggered? No, I'm, I mean, it, it, I'm not a design engineer per se, so as far as being able to get really to the, to the nuts and bolts of the differences between and why you would choose them, um, again, like you said, Mark, is that, you know, IPC is going to recommend that you go one way when your design starts, you know, seeing increased layer count and everything like that. At the end of the day, they're kind of the same difference. Um, they're both there to serve a purpose to, you know, um, incorporate technology and routing in very, very dense boards. Um, they do a great job of doing it. And it's really kind of, um, it, it just depends on your pad stack, your layout and everything like that on whether or not a stacked or staggered um, uh, 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 drill cycle is gonna be the best fit. Okay, well, thanks, Greg. Sure, um, man. And, and then we've got one other question before we move on to back drilling. Um, is there a concern with regards to via density and board warpage, or is this not a concern? I've never heard via density related to board warpage. Uh, no, maybe I, you I have? Either. No, no, no. So board warpage typically has to do with unbalanced stackups um, and differential coefficients of thermal expansion. Uh, the copper doesn't expand anywhere near as much as the, the dielectrics do. So if you don't have a even, uh, and when I say even, what I mean is symmetric about the mid-plane uh, stack up, you absolutely can end up with a potato chip. Uh, it's, it's happened to me. Uh, Greg is very aware of that incident. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it happens, um, but not due to vias. So hopefully that helps. The only oh. thing with that, that, yeah, the only you know, downside to that too is it, I, it's not going to necessarily affect the performance of the V or anything like that. It's just not going to be testable, workable, assemblable, et cetera. Um, if you kind of get past a certain threshold of warp, bow and twist. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, oh, you know, I think back drilling is, is later on in the episode. So this is an assembly issue. Vias come in a few different flavors, but really what they are, are big holes in your board. And if you put a via inside or near a pad or underneath say a BGA, solder is going to go down into that hole during assembly. And that's going to leave you with a, a component that doesn't have the proper solder fillet. It, it's not gonna meet inspection criteria. It's not gonna be electrically connected to your board. It's not gonna be very well mechanically connected to your board. And you got a board that's gonna fail. Did you, uh, I think you've actually got some experience with this just in the last couple of days. Yeah, Mark, this is something that, you know, on the assembly side of, of, of PCBs, that this is something that unfortunately we inherently see uh, daily um, when, we're putting, uh, when we're putting parts on boards. Um, you know, to the folks that are, you know, on the webinar and everything like that, when you guys have a VN pad design, or if you have a, a, comp a component, whether it's a, a, a passive cap or resistor, like you're kind of seeing in this image right here, or it's an IC or bottom terminal component, whatever it is, take the extra time and, um, support the, the small cost of actually filling or tenting the hole. If filling the hole, if it's obviously something where a component's being placed or tenting the hole, if it's not necessarily functional to the component itself. But what happens is that what you see in this picture is that 
you have your via, and then obviously there's solder paste that's placed on that. As soon as it goes through reflow and sees that thermal excursion, that solder just gets immediately sucked down into that hole. It, fix, it, it, it thieves and wicks all that solder out. And so what you're left with is a, a poor connection at best. Um, at the end of the day, it becomes something that is not reliable. Um, and uh, we have no way to validate the longevity of what that connection is going to do. I have no idea what that's going to do in two months, let alone two years. Um, it is so inherently important um, that with VM pad designs or VIAs that do have components placed on them, that they are filled and plated over. So we have the best possible um, solder connection, the solder joint. Um, and ultimately what it means for us is that it's not a phone call back to you guys saying, I can't meet IPC on this connection right here because of the design. Um, it saves a phone call, it saves a delay, it saves a late shipment. Um, there's just a lot of things involved that we can prevent from that. So this designer could have solved that problem by moving the via to the left, let's say 10 mils or whatever it is, um, and then creating a solder dam with the green solder mask, right? It Solder will not move across solder mask. It's, it's there. Um, it's not, solder. it's not hydrophobic. That's not the right word, but you can use that to keep the solder on the pad. Uh, and we're going to show you what tinting and all that looks like in a future slide. But over on the left, I wanted to explain that picture. We're looking at a 3D x-ray of the bottom, um, basically an inverted part, right? The chip is down on the bottom. We can't really see that. And then you see this array of these little balls and you can actually see the vias have sucked the solder up into them, right? It is wicked right up in there. And that since the solder's in the hole, it's not on the pad. You've just made a, a part that needs to be reworked or you got to throw the whole board away. Correct. So, yeah, there's a huge opportunity with that. I mean, in this scenario right here, especially when you're looking at BGAs and LGAs and everything, where you're looking at, you know, a very expensive part in relation to your passive parts, um, the last thing you want to do is having to be reworking these parts. Um, it is so easy to lift pads, um, you know, damage the via, the barrel, and everything like that of the hole just from going into rework by exposing it to another thermal cycle. Um, you can completely mitigate that altogether um, by getting your, uh, you're getting your views filled. Okay, we've got, I mean, this generated a dozen questions. <laughs> it's just slide by itself. Uh, some of the questions like when we're talking about tinting and filling and all that, we actually have a separate slide on that. So if it's okay with you folks, um, I'm going to delete those until those show up. Um, but we, we're going to cover that here in just a second. Um, Question was, was this build to print? Wouldn't our design checks have highlighted the issue? Would a DFM check flag these? 100% it would. And so it is our responsibility and our opportunity um, from board manufacturing and even into assembly. So um, I'll start with the board side of it. When we're going through the DFM process, one of the design rule checks is that if there's VN pad, and if there's VN pad, is that does the does the drawing call out for it to be via filled? Is there an epoxy non-conductive fill, a conductive fill, et cetera? Um, if there is not, um, then that is going to be a hold and a technical question that's going to go back to the customer and say, "Hi, we noticed that there's VN pad design in this in, in this um, uh, file. Um, do you want us to fill the vias, or do you want to leave them as is?" Um, the caveat to leaving them as is, is that there is not a 100% a guarantee that we can meet IPC criteria of voiding, of solder fill, of coplanarity, uh, especially of a, like a BGA or an LGA, if it's sitting on top of a VN pad, um, uh, pad array. So there's a lot of things that go into the backside of it. Um, but to answer the question, um, those are always caught on the DFM side. On the DFA side, if um, I'm going to use advanced assembly for this, is that if advanced assembly is taking in a consigned kit where the customer is procuring their own parts and boards, um, it is our responsibility to identify it 
Um, and either one, we can give the customer feedback and we can go through a potential rework process, um, or we can say, you know, our best, best stab at getting, you know, X amount of uh, voiding under this component is going to be, you know, whatever it ends up being, but it, it really reduces uh, the ability to meet spec at the end of the day. Um, so the slight offset of cost on getting vias filled um, is going to save, I mean, it could save thousands in the long run. Okay. Uh, here we've got a, a few more images of, you know, these are x-ray images. On the left, we've got a thermal pad in the middle with a bunch of vias that are in it. And if you look around the vias, there's a lighter color. What am I looking at versus a darker color where there aren't vias? What am I looking at there, Greg? It's an air bubble. It's a pocket. So that was something that had, uh, it's a void, essentially is what it's called. Um, and because those vias were placed there, um, it is thieving solder out of that bottom terminal connection. Um, IPC calls out a um, specific uh, tolerance of voiding to void free. Um, if the design, depending on the design, it may automatically violate the ability to place that component and keep it within spec. It's kind of what I was alluding to in my previous comment. Yeah. So uh, isn't that about 50% voiding? Correct. Okay. Yeah, so we, we shoot for 75% um, as just kind of a general rule of thumb and advanced assembly, but 50% um, is kind of our, that's our minimum. I don't like to hit minimums. Yeah, so the reason that voids are a problem is because they're not thermally conductive. Uh, air is an incredibly good insulator, and that keeps heat from going from your, your IC into your board, and then your IC can overheat and your board can fail, and you know all sorts of bad things can happen. So having open vias under a pad isn't good, but the issue that you have is that it costs a lot of money to fill those holes, and engineers don't want to pay that money. So it becomes this big fight between the assembly house who can't make your board and the designer who doesn't want to pay to do it the right way. I've got a solution for you, though. Um, and that is IPC 7093. They actually have a series of patterns and uh, things that you can use for your thermal pads. And basically, you're, you're covering part of that pad with your solder, your solder mask. And you're creating dams. You are going to lose a little bit of, of area. There's going to be non-thermal connection, but it's a prescribed and predictable amount. Versus if we go over to this picture back here on the left, it's going to look different each time. And if it's less than 50%, you've got to rework that or throw out the board. So Solder mask dams are 70, IPC 7093, if you want to learn more about that. And I think we actually have a webinar on our blog at, at some point on that. So what do you do? Um, we were talking a minute ago about your different VIA options. Open VIAs are a problem. You can tint them if they're less than, say, 50 mils. And essentially what you're doing there is just removing the hole from your artwork layer and the machines will then go and they'll, they'll put the uh, LPI over it. A slightly, and it, it's uh, surface tension that's keeping it in place. A slightly more expensive option is with LPI filled. You'll basically have somebody sit there and just force this uh, solder mask into the hole. That keeps the solder from being able to go in there because there's no room for it anymore. And the last option is an epoxy filled and plated over. That's the most expensive one. Engineers never want to pay for that, but that is the highest reliability way that you can go. Anything else you want to add there? No, Mark, and I got to kind of tip my cap to you on this visual representation because this is a, a really, really crystal clear set of options that you can have when you're, you know, you're putting your design together. You know, I get that a lot of people, if, you know, they're designing something that is, you know, at its very most, um, you know, NPI stage of, you know, development and everything like that might not want to shoehorn all the funding into epoxy filled and everything like that. But, um, you know, at a minimum tenting and LPI fill is going to be the best and most cost-effective way to mitigate things. Obviously, if you're putting something into um, uh, either downhole 
or as a payload for space, um, something that's going into some type of defense vehicle or anything like that, um, you know, your, your highest reliability is going to be your epoxy field, whether it's conductive or non-conductive, depending, you know, it just depends on what you want. Yeah. Um, so just as a, a quick reminder, open vias and tinted vias cost the same amount, but you have to spend a little more time futzing around with your artwork layers to make it tinted. But it's free. It doesn't cost you anything. Solder can't get in there. Um, you do want to use kind of smaller diameter vias to make sure that the uh, that it doesn't break, but it, it works just fine. LPI filled costs a little bit more. Epoxy filled costs the most. You know, the Vipo plaids, via in pad plated over. Um, so I think the, you, uh, go the, ahead. Just, sorry, Mark, just not to interrupt. It. I, I think, you know, if you're looking for more kind of a proof of concept or something like that um, on an early design, you know, tempting is fine. Um, but yeah, the uh, again, like I said, the later options are going to be more uh, more yeah. either a higher volume of a uh, of a proto run or a mid volume to standard production run for your company. Yeah, um, and like I said, for free, you know, you you can use um, IPC seventy ninety three pads. You can also pull these. Um, these images uh, were designed by Tom Hauser over at uh, I think it's PCBLibraries.com. He's got he's got these for you. Uh, I forget what the software title is called, but if you don't want to buy the IPC 7093 standard, you can just go over there and they've got parts libraries that are incredible. I love them. Um, and, and you can pull these for your parts, for your bottom, uh, bottom terminated and thermal, uh, thermally conductive, uh, thermally, they're not thermal, thermal pads. I forget the, the exact terminology. Now, one okay, of the things- good. One of the things that engineers run into is they don't differentiate between mounting holes, which don't need to be plated, and uh, your vias, which do need to be plated. So one of the easiest ways for you to do that is just supply two different drill files. That works just fine because they're going to be used at two different times in the production process anyway. Or you can specify things out in the, um, in the drill file. Now, since we're talking about drilling, it's probably a good time to bring up back drilling. Having through hole vias is the cheapest way to go, as we said earlier. But from a signal integrity standpoint, it can be a pain in the butt because the impedance discont discontinuity is so great from the via to the rest of the world. You can get these reflections and it can absolutely close your eye diagram. So you can back drill. If you've got the thicker the board is and the further um, your via stub and the via stub is this extra piece of metal that's not doing anything, um, the greater the length, the bigger the problem it becomes. But you can relatively cheaply go back and drill that extra copper out. Uh, and I'm going to skip the eye diagrams for now because we are running a little long. So with the back drill, you actually after everything's done, you go in and you start drilling away that extra material, that extra stub. There is a cost associated with it, but it can be the difference between your signal work, your board working and your board not. Another option would be, I don't know if you can uh, see this, this diagram here that I've gone from say layer one to layer three. If this design had gone all the way to the bottom layer on the board, there would be no stub. And that would have solved the problem too. So just something to keep in mind, you can and should go back and back drill if you've got high speed signals, something with low transition uh, times, lows, uh, low to high or high to low times. And as far as how you would specify that, you can put comments in your drill files, just put a semicolon at the front of it. And for example, here, Drill layers one through 11, don't cut 12. Make sure layer 12 doesn't get poked through. Drill layers one through five, do not cut six. And that's how you would specify a control depth file. Is there any, anything else you'd like to see in those, Greg? Or? Uh, no, that's actually kind of textbook as far as what you have laid out. Um, the, uh, the actual visual representation of where the, uh, the vias are gonna go and any type of back drilling. Um, whether that's created by the customer um, or it's recreated in the CAM engineering department um, is used as uh, um, 
reference documents all through the production floor. Okay. Um, with that, we do have some questions. We've got 17 open ones. Uh, one of them is uh, somebody's angry with us, Greg. Very angry. Oh. Brace yourself. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know before we get to it. All right. How often do you see connection issues related to misregistration of layers? Is there anything the board designer needs to think about? Um, did you want that one? Or I'd be happy to take it too. Well, why don't you take a piece of it and I'll kind of parlay off of okay. what you got. Sure. So if you're designing a class three board, IPC wants an annular ring around that via of two mils on the outside and one mil on the inside. The easiest way to make sure that if there is misregistration, that that, that thing still meets IPC is not designed to the absolute minimum if you can at all help it, right? You, you're going to be putting in a 14 mil pad. Okay, let, if you've got room, make it 16 mil, make it 18 mil. So if there is any slight misregistration, it doesn't affect the, you know, the design at all. So don't design to absolute bare minimums if you can at all help it. Um, what would you like to add, Greg? Uh, the other piece that I would just add to it is the, you know, there's been a lot of obviously technology advancements and equipment, you know, on, on the fabrication side that um, can really mitigate any type of layer to layer shift or anything like that. So um, while there is still a risk, especially when you start going down the HDI route and stack vias, where it is essentially critical that regardless of what your stack looks like, that they are, that your pad layers are on top of each other throughout the entire um, uh, Z axis. But, um, you know, there's different ways that we can, again, like I said, minimize all that to even to no issue before it even goes into lamination. You know, the biggest, you know, issue that happens is that, you know, once that pre-preg starts to become more liquidous and it starts, your layers can start to kind of move around during um, the lamination process is when you can start to get a little misregistration. Um, but, you know, we've come pretty far in the way that we, you know, that we punch layers, the way that we, you know, the way that we laminate layers, the way that we scale and drill layers and everything like that. Okay. Really kind of hit, the, hit the target on the spot. Next question. If you have no vias in pad, is there a useful benefit to filling vias? I would say yes. Um, from a contamination standpoint, um, if you've got something that let's say you're gonna pot it and bury it under the ground, those vias provide a path for moisture to get in to your board and start wicking through the side, which can then generate calf failures. So there is a benefit. It just depends on the application, uh, the level of reliability. If I was making a board that was going to, I don't know, let's say a radio telescope in Palm Springs, I wouldn't really worry about it. But if I am making a board that is going into a radio telescope in, say, Antarctica, I would definitely do it. Uh, what else would you like to add there, buddy? Honestly, I mean, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. It's something that it just depends on what the application is going into. I mean, is it, you know, something that's going into, you know, uh, a commercial toaster or is it going as a payload into uh, the National Space Station? You know, it it's just completely different opposite ends of the spectrum as far as what the end product usage is for. Yeah. Okay. Um can you solder resist just the inside of the hole and not the pad for via in pad designs? No, I don't think you can, can you? I will second that. Okay, well, there we go. Um, think, okay, so the way that, if this is a prototype build, okay, the way that that hole is gonna get filled, and maybe even in a production fill, is some guy's gonna be sitting there with a, high pressure syringe forcing LPI into that hole. It doesn't just magically stop once he's done. Some's gonna come out on top, some's gonna come out on bottom, right? The only way that you could get copper back is you'd have to replanarize the board. I, I just don't see that being anything that would ever happen. Uh, that LPI is gonna come out on either side to properly fill that hole. So no. Question, are filled vias then plated sometimes? Um, for Vipo via in pad plated over. So you fill it with a thermally conduct and kind of electrically conductive, but mostly thermally conductive epoxy. And then you put it back in the electroplating tanks 
And then you go through and you replanarize the thing, right? It goes through a big sander that flattens it all back out. That's your VIPO. But if you're just doing LPI, you would not then go and plate the LPI. Correct. Anything else on that one? No, nope, that's exactly right. Okay. Um, ooh. Ooh, okay, buddy. I don't know that this, I, I'll tell you what I think, but I don't know that I'm going to have the exact right answer on this one. But the question is this, the microvia cross-section is not pure calendar, but like a trapezoid shape with a minor difference between top and bottom diameters. Which value do you recommend to use in simulation, the top, bottom, or the average for the most accurate correlation? Here's what I think, Cal. Um, and I, I want to preface, preface this with saying I've never actually tried the difference, but it is a trapezoid. The microvias are made by a laser, which due to the way that the laser focuses the beam is gonna have a trapezoid shape. But remember these things are like one and two mils big. Um, the difference between the top and the bottom is maybe uh, a 10th of a, of a mil, maybe less than that. It's not gonna be significant. You're gonna have more variation in the rest of your board to worry about than what's happening in that via. So when you do your simulation and your finite element analysis, I really, my gut tells me you're not gonna see a difference. However, I wanna preface that with saying I have never done that simulation. So I don't really know, but I just don't think it matters. Anything you wanna put on that one, buddy? No, I, again, I think you're right on the spot with that one too. It's such a, if you're looking at it at such a granular level at that stage, then I would assume that every other issue or every potential opportunity for an issue with the board um, has already been vetted out. Yeah, there, there would be so many other things to worry about. That would be like a second and third order effect. There would be other things that would be a much bigger deal to you. Um, should label the x-ray image as that's what it is. Oh, okay, so this is going back to our x-ray image, you know, that inverted one, uh, they asked for labels. Sorry about that. Um, We've got a comment that we should not mention new terminology without having already defined it. Um, sorry about that. We try to, but a lot of this stuff is, we do recognize that it's jargon um, if you're new to the field, but this is language that we use every day. And sometimes it's hard to remember what is new and what isn't to someone it's, um, it's kind of like forgetting to introduce your wife at a dinner party, you know, after you've introduced her 50 times, you forget on the 51st. So sorry about that. Is there anything specific that we can define? Uh, I don't know where that one showed up. In the, okay. uh, we started accumulating lots of open questions. So I don't really know when that came up, but, uh, unfortunately. Um, is there an app that can determine the void percentage? Okay, so I think this is going back to our thermal pads. Mm -hmm. The answer is, um, Mm, yes and no. The voiding is somewhat random. It, I mean, all manufacturing is variable. We don't know if you're going to get 60% on, you know, one part placement and 40 on the next. That's why if you use the IPC thermal pad definition, you're going to get a prescribed amount of voiding each and every time. Um, I want to say it's 20%. I, I, I want to say those in it could be, you know, let's let's go with plus or minus 10. Um, those things assume that you're gonna lose part of the part of the connection, part of the thermal connection, but it's gonna be the same amount of thermal connection every time. So it just removes the manufacturing variability from it. Um, what the exact number is, I don't remember off the top of my head. Is this an issue even with tinted vias? Um, I'm afraid. The question came in at 11.45. I don't really know what we were talking about then. Uh, if you'd like to ask again, anonymous attendee, we'd be happy to try to take a stab at it. Um, can you run into a problem with too many BGA parts too close together? Um, the short answer is yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're, if the design, whether they're being on the top side or bottom side of the assembly, um, there is certain specifications 
and uh, limits as far as how close and what proximity the machine can place these parts together. So from an actual placement standpoint, there's going to be, you know, more <clears throat> of the, uh, you know, again, part of the DFA process, the design for assembly process, as far as functionality goes, and as far as um, solder and vias and everything like that, um, nothing that I would have um, any specific information about. Okay. Question is, what is LPI? That stands for liquid photo imageable, and it's referring to solder mask. LPI solder mask is the, the layer on your board that gives it its color, right? It's the green stuff. This is the stuff that acts as a solder dam uh, to keep the solder from moving around and it protects your board. So if you see a red, uh, a red board, a green board or whatever, that outside layer, the colored pigmented layer is the solder mask um, to answer your question. Thank you for not typing in all caps on that one. Okay. Um, Need to state tint his limitation due to via size, correct? Yes. The amount that you can tint depends on the via size. However, the amount that we can comfortably tint now is usually much greater than the average size of vias on a board, right? We can do 50 mil uh, via hole reliably. Well, nobody makes 50 mil vias. You know, people are doing 13, 18 mil holes. So you can get the via tinting with pretty repeatable results um, unless you're, you're using really, really large vias. And you just typically don't see designers use those because they take up too much board space and don't really offer you um, much of anything else in return for using that larger via. So yeah, you can get away with it. Should you tint both sides of the via? Um, I have heard that if liquids like solvents are left in a tinted via, tinted on both sides during manufacture, that you can have the liquids explosively evaporate during reflow, causing the tint to be blown off, like a balloon popping. You want to take that one, Greg? Um, it's certainly possible. I uh, don't see it often, but, you know, there is an inherent risk when, you know, you cap one side and the other side's open. Um, so much of the PCB fabrication process is a wet process. Um, and if that material is not fully flushed and evacuated out, um, there's, again, it can open up all sorts of different issues from Pandora's box on that side. Interesting. I had not heard of the via popping thing before. So thank you for that. Um, what side tinting a problem still if open pad is on a heat pad. There is still air, I imagine, in the hole to escape or pop out with moisture during. Okay, so that's the same question. So yeah, um, if you tint both sides, um, apparently we can create a balloon that can pop. The epoxy fill is thermally conductive. Uh, the question was, is it thermally conductive? The answer is yes. Is it electrically conductive? Um, not in any meaningful way. Um, it, it's either or. I mean, you know, it, it, depending on, it, there's two specific different types of fill. There's not conductive fill and there's conductive fill. Um, so, you, I mean, specifically, you would have to call out which specific material you'd want to be filled in it, whether it's conductive or non-conductive. One doesn't do the other. But your copper is highly conductive. Your current's going to go through the copper more times than not. Um, I, I guess there could be some concerns of of when you want to, you need that little bit extra, but um, I don't know when those would be. I've heard of issues with chemical, re okay, this is the tinting question again. Uh, would you mind sending us copies of the presentation? Absolutely, give us a couple business days to edit down the video and we will get these out to you, um, be happy to. Is back drilling less, more or less expensive than blind or buried vias? All right, there's a caveat there because sometimes engineers will call out back drilling to, you know, 14 different depths. That's ridiculously expensive. If you're just back drilling to one depth um, on one side of the board, way cheaper than blind or buried. After that, uh, do you happen to know where the cutoff is? I don't know what the delta is and where the threshold is as far as where it starts to turn into, you know, a a non-value add versus going through a multi-lamination versus back drill. Um, it, it, it's kind of the, you know, the, the too much of something is, is just going to result in something else. So whether you have, you know, a ton of, you know, 
the vias as far as different you know stages with you know micro and blind and buried or you have just a bunch of different bacterial depths that you're trying to hit it's just going to overcomplicate the process and just be inherently expensive yeah i will say uh one of the things that i saw where i was just you know what are you doing is is one of those things where the designer had back drill called out on both sides of the board it was like a 14 layer board. And I want to say they asked these poor drill operators to drill to every single layer. It was ridiculous versus just picking some signal layers and running everything on, you know, and getting down to maybe two back drill depths or three back drill depths, you know, instead of all of the back drill depths that are conceivably possible. So just try to talk to your, I mean, talk to your fabricators, ask them what they can do, what they can't do. Just because they can do it doesn't mean they should do it. It can get really expensive. Um, some manufacturers say they combine the plated and non-plated holes and ignore the non-plating call out. They figure out if something is supposed to be plated by seeing if copper is over the top of it in the artwork. That bit me on my last design. So um, some manufacturers and since you mentioned Osh Park in your question, I'll, I'll bring them up too. They want quantity. They're, Osh Park isn't really a manufacturer. They're a conglomerator, right? They don't have their own board house. They use rail circuits in Hollister, California. So Osh Park collects everybody's designs. Uh, their software doesn't want to deal with all of that. So they've written some code that goes and they figure out what's supposed to be plated and what's not. And if you need something more than that, they expect you to go somewhere else and talk straight to the manufacturer. Um, I don't really know what to tell you about that other than Oshpark isn't really a fabricator. They use fabricators and they're great. I use Oshpark, but it's kind of the, they're kind of there for the basic stuff. Um, and, and they're great for it because it's cheaper than you could go out and get a panel made yourself. But anyways. I should, okay, Stuart, I'm sorry. I don't know what you're referring to. Uh, you, sh you said I should add that this point was made in a TTM seminar, so the source is trustworthy. Uh, with, on my view of things, it, it's not showing me the rest of your comments, so I don't know what you're referring to. Um, going back to the BGA solder void percentage, no app camera that can distinguish the contrast to show the void. Um, I don't think so, Stephen, because we have to use x-rays, right? There's an x-ray machine that, that does that. Um, if there is some app or, or something along those lines, I'm not aware of it. There could be, um, I, I just don't know. Can I share this article? Absolutely. Share whatever you like. Microvias. Um, I don't really know that that's a question. If it is, I don't know. Or if it's a comment, I don't know what you're asking. Is drilling the most expensive step in the fabrication process? Greg? Um, it can be. It just, <laughs> you know, um, there's so many different variables that create cost within fabrication. Um, drilling can certainly be one of them. Um, the short answer is, is yes, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And it seems like Craig has shared a resource in the Q&A for everybody. So thank you, Craig. Uh, that's, I think you had one of the other comments that I didn't aware, I wasn't aware of where it said, can I share this article? Um, that must have been the article. So it, it's just my screen doesn't show that to me. Sorry. All right. Via tinting again. I think this is our last one. Um, if a via is tinted on one side, under what circumstances can chemical residue in the via interfere with proper soldering? Is this dependent on the via's aspect ratio? I have had this happen with another supplier with eight mil vias under a BGA on a 63 mil thick board. Greg? To me, um, it would certainly leave an opportunity there because again, if that material, if there's any entrapment inside the via itself, um, what can happen is that whether it's during the assembly process or during any of the fabrication process prior to assembly, um, as soon as that, if there's any liquidous material, it's gonna completely cam uh, uh, um, uh, contaminate the SMD pad. And as soon as there is a contaminant that's on there, it completely makes that pad non-wettable. Um, and you're gonna get a pretty lousy solder joint, if anything at all. 
So there, there's just certainly an inherent risk for that. Okay, and then we've got one last question hiding in the chat. Um, can we say something about CAF and VIAs, how to predict issues? CAF, C-A-F, um, conductive anodic filament, you need three conditions. You need moisture, you need high voltages, so a high uh, potential difference, and you need cracks, you need a path for these ions to start moving into and then form wires. So basically you, you've got electromigration, you've, you've got metal moving from a via somewhere through, a, um, you know, it, it does need a path, which you get because epoxy and fiberglass, you know, it can follow the fiberglass traces and whatever, and it can create a short circuit. It takes time to happen. It's got to be enough moisture present. It's got to be enough um, voltage present, and it's got to take time. What else can we say about calf failures, Greg? Uh, Mark, that's right up your alley. Um, that is going to okay. be completely out of my area of expertise, sir. No problem. Well, then that's probably all that I'll, I'll say about calf failures. Um, how do you predict issues if you've got a high electric potential gradient in your board, if you've got moisture present in your environment. And, you know, there are ways to avoid it. There is a new material out. Uh, I forget what it's called, but we talked about it in our last webinar. But basically it's uh, a material that doesn't crack during uh, thermal cycling or during the fabrication process. And there are no calf failures because there's no place for these filaments to grow and start pushing things away. Think of it like a tree root, right? Um, trees can, you know, if there's a crack in the concrete, they can start working their way in there and start pushing it apart. And, you know, eventually it goes to the other side and the same thing happens with your, your conductors, except in this case, it creates a short circuit. Bad things happen. All right, that is the end of the questions. And I'd like to thank everybody for joining us and everybody for still hanging around. We did go quite a bit longer than I thought um, so thank you for hanging out with us. We did record this entire webinar and we will make it available to all participants within two business days. We'll send a, a reminder out to you. It will also be available on our blog at aepcb.com forward slash blog. And if you need slides, if you have questions or you'd like us to go to anything in depth, I would be more than happy to. So Greg, oh yes, um, Sir. for those of you, those of you that, if, that are hearing Chester in the background, I will let him know you said hello. Thank you for that. Greg, anything you want to say? No, nope, thanks for your time, man. It's been a good chat. Man, that was intense. These guys, they're, they're not giving us any slack, are they? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Greg. Well, well, yeah, thank a you. lot of great questions. A lot of great yep. questions, guys. Thank you so much. Very good. Yo, thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.